Hurry for small victories. All right. All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Here I am with Mario at Mario's Board Repair Shop. Um, Hello. I'd like to introduce yourself and what you do. Sure. Hi. Um, my name is Mario. I am, well, the long and short of it, I have been for a long time like a one-wheel YouTuber. And for the last couple of years, I've had a PEV repair shop, mostly working on electric skateboards, occasionally on one wheels, scooters, things like that, custom lithium ion battery builds, battery repair, all that stuff. Um, and more recently, I've been branching out because of, you know, the waning fervency of the one wheel fanboyness. And so, yeah, I've been doing more content tutorial stuff about how to fix your batteries, uh, battery safety. Um, the, my favorite video that I've done recently is I tested a lithium ion fireproof bag for electric skateboards. So I put together a test battery and blew it up. And so it's a big old fire show. And I talk a lot about how battery fires happen, how you can prevent them, what to do, store it, all that stuff. You know, I've been really leaning because I have batteries everywhere and battery fires in New York city are a thing. And so kind of leaning the PEV community towards fewer battery fires is kind of where my heart currently is and so that's 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 the long of it i suppose it was one comment you left that resonated with me that made me want to like just kind of visit a lot of these shops and i mean i just wanted to read it it says i know future motion watches my videos they've said so and of the years i've been making videos in the one wheel trying to help the community the disillusionment with the company has been painful and their comments talking about someone in their garage making batteries not being safe they were talking about people like me who started a repair business, a battery building business, and has found some modicum of success in doing so. I opened and repaired one-wheel batteries. They're fine, middle of the road in craftsmanship. The packs I put into electric skateboards and scooters are much more robustly built, and I've spent the past two years teaching myself DC electrical theory and practicing the manual skills needed to work on PEVs like e-skates, one-wheels, and scooters. And I am formally, am I a formally educated engineer? No, but I'm not an idiot making batteries with a hammer and scotch tape. And this last release was the nail in the coffin for me with Future Motion. And for me, what, what resonated was when I started working on Apple products, I was living in, an, in a house that was filled with termites and I was meeting people in a park in Herald <laughs> Square. And, with, and there was always this kind of lack of confidence from the customers because you know, you're, you're a 19 year old kid in sweatpants and a t-shirt working out of a park. So even now, Apple, you know, there are a lot of times where somebody at the Apple store will say, if somebody can do this, they're lying or they're going to screw you or it's not going to work or the screen they're putting in is wrong and it's going to mess up your machine. And it was real. Now it's different because at least I have a store, I have employees, I have over a thousand reviews on Google and all that. But back then it was really aggravating when they would tell customers things that weren't true from that position of authority where they're, and where they're saying, you know, if they say that they can fix your board no that's not going to work or if he replaces your screen then it's going to fry your board all this other type of stuff right. and it really pissed me off because it's like even 15 years later you have companies that are denigrating the person working out of their garage but oftentimes the person working out of their garage figures things out that the people working in the in the prim and proper pretty looking store never do and yeah. people from the independent repair community have found so many flaws on apple products before they were even able to issue their own recalls on them so it really pisses me off when they when they speak that way about people like you that are doing quality work out of their garage. I appreciate that. That, that means a lot. Yeah. Um, I've been making one wheel videos and I mean one wheel videos. That's it for about three years. Um, I first bought a one wheel XR in November 2018 and... I wrote it everywhere. It became a real positive effect on my mental health, being able to explore, write, all that stuff, and learning it, meeting people. It was it turned my life around, and so natural. And that's the experience for a lot of one wheel guys and girls. Um, and you know, so when you see this kind of behavior from a company, and then people who aren't one wheel folks ask, well, just you know, and it's you brought this up. Just don't buy it. Just do this. And you know, there's one side of that where you know a few enthusiasts not buying a product might not sway the behavior of the company, but for a lot of people, and it's no small percentage of people, uh, you can't just sell your one wheel and say goodbye to the whole thing because they've met people. It has had a positive influence in their life. It's become part of their identity, and so you know that's with reference to the the board itself. And so, you know, the last few years, the the modifying community has been kind of like at odds with it, with Future Motion for a while. Um, my relationship with modification is a little bit tenuous, but up until just now, I've been able to repair my own boards. That is a XR. This is the one from 2018. That's the one that people were saying was more fixable than the GT. Right. And there are different versions of this. This is 
kind of a unicorn. From 2018, it was hardware revision 4208, and into the nitty gritty. Now on that specific board, I've never modified it. I just replaced the battery, opened it up, built the exact same one with brand new cells. I even took all the old wires and put it into the new one. So I had to like less waste. And now it's got another four years or so of use. And there you go. Uh, they revised the XR several times. And the one that really became the most problematic was between hardware 4210 and 4211. And that was when they shifted how the BMS reads battery capacity, which removed the ability for people to install extended range larger batteries. And the very first thing that many people ran into were incompatible hardware errors. It was when the BMS had a different communication protocol to the motor controller. And randomly throughout its life, regardless of whether you modified the board or not, the BMS handshake with the ESC would just have a hiccup and the board wouldn't work anymore. One of the things I was hearing about this is that, uh, tell me if this is uh, true, is that on one of these models, it would be, it would be set so that it, it was only set to a certain amount of amp hours. So it wasn't reading the voltage of the pack to, and saying, you know, once you get below this voltage, turn it off. It was just assuming that the pack is a certain amount of amp hours. And once you go below that set of amp hours, then it turns it off. So even if you actually did put a larger battery in it, it would still die at that because it was designed to, you know, only use one or two or five amp hours and then be, be kaput. Correct. That pretty much started, I can't say for certain, because, you know, with different hardware revisions, they had also different firmware revisions. So around 4210, 4211 was when they implemented that. Um, and so when you check your battery level in the app, it would have the 100 to 0%, and it shifted how it read your battery percentage from voltage of the whole pack to amp hour consumption. And so if you put in, and also in the latest revision, you put in a new, like a extended pack into a 4212 XR, you could have 580 watt hours worth of energy to use. It would only assume you're using 352 ish watt hours counted by however they do usually amp hour consumption. And once it reached that, you look at the app, it would say zero, the board would tilt all the way up and kind of drag the tail. It's what they call low battery pushback. It changes the default, the default balancing position to mm -hmm. right about there. And it says, you're done. You got to plug me in and charge me. So even if you added more battery, wouldn't really matter because as far as the board's concerned, you've used what the stock energy is and you're done. Got to plug it in and charge it. Um, so if you, you wouldn't be able to use a larger battery or backpack battery or anything else because nothing. there's a specific set amount. Right. What, what, um, is, what is the point of that? I don't know. I mean, the... the because that seems like it would be an amazing upsell. I mean, me, like, as some, I have five batteries on my e-bike. It, 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 it has a 300-mile range if I have no passenger, 200 with a passenger. And that's that's something that I'd be willing to pay for. That's, I mean, I, I don't travel 300 miles on a regularly. I just wanted mm -hmm. to make it for the hell of it because it was cool. R right. And that's um, the type of thing, if you're the type of person that's going to ride a one-wheel device around instead of a car or just pedal a bicycle, you're probably the type of person that wants to be able to do that. Right. I mean, I'm very much in the vein of... You bought it, you do whatever the hell you want with it, you break it, it's your problem. Fine. I've built custom electric skateboards for people that have ridden it into the ground and they brought it to me and say, hi, it doesn't work anymore. And then when I open it up, I call them and I show them pictures. I'm like, you clearly did this, this, and this. And that's why, in my professional opinion, it's broken. And I tell them, so to fix it, it's got to do this, this, and this. I'll cover this because this isn't really like a replacement, but this, I just have to like order everything fresh. And they always go, fine, I know what I did, just make it work again, yeah. right? And that's fine. Whether they add on extra lights or start paralleling crap into the main discharge of the battery, fine. As long as they didn't bring me like a pile of ashes, you know, it's very much like a person-to-person -person kind of thing. Like, fine, I get it, I'll fix it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, and this is a, very much a value judgment, say you can't do this to the thing that you bought that is no longer in my possession and it's yours. It seems to be that as the one wheel hardware revisions and firmware revisions went on, that's kind of the thing. We just don't want you to use outside of stock configuration. And that itself has been its own little discussion in the community. Um, and even so, like I said, I very rarely modify my boards. Um, but that one wheel, whether that was a new hardware revision or not, I could still fix it. The battery would run out. It would die at 60%. I'd figure... The battery's worn out, I'll build a new one, and then I'll get X amount of years out of that one, and that's fine. The issue is, as you've heard, this is the GT. Yes, I bought one. It looks very similar. It does. It's, it's like a big one-wheel pint, 
uh, if you poke around on the inside as far as you can without unplugging the battery because it will brick. Um, this thing is and will remain the way it is. That's it. The battery in it is the battery that will stay in it unless future motion says so. So There are people that have asked, can you just put some other battery in parallel so it never thinks it's unplugged so while you're working on their battery after you unplug it? I have read that. But you don't want to try to brick your own $2,200 device to find out. Yeah, because here's the thing. Um, here's a one-wheel XR battery. Uh -huh. um, and so I, in principle, yes, you could theoretically parallel a power source, battery or power supply or otherwise, but you would have to do a number of things that I don't think are practically possible. So this is a 15S battery, and that is an 18S battery. So you're going to have to do more of it. And you've got a main discharge which is that XT60, which I'll talk about in a second. And then you have the balance connector, which is 26 pins. And it is the tiniest thing. Also, side note, the crimps and connectors for the BMS are damn near impossible to find now for reasons unknown. These I've had for the last two years. And I, I get emails all the time, hey, I'm trying to do like my own battery replacement. Mine died like two months ago. Do you have these connectors? And so I'll send them like two plus like a whole bunch of these, but I'm running low. Um, DigiKey doesn't have them. Mauser doesn't have them. These are thermistors that go in here because they're within a narrow um, yeah. range. These were out of stock everywhere. In fact, these thermistors are the reason that I knew that Newark was a thing. There's a lot of things that I've needed that have been out of stock weirdly, like, you know, just LED drivers for a MacBook Air. Yeah, but just stuff that I always figured I could always go online and buy for two dollars over the past year and a half is just, been, you know, we're, we're getting more of them in December 2022. And I'll be like, what? There you go. So uh, what I wanted to go over with you for a little a bit of time oh, here. Oh, sorry, I, the, the oh. parallel thing. I just want to answer that quick yeah, and sorry. then I will shut I the hell up. I completely forgot where I was. No. <laughs> um, so these two things plug directly into the BMS. Um, so if you wanted to parallel them and you had no idea what the BMS was looking for in terms of which power to get like cut off, mm -hmm. you would have to tap into both of these main discharge wires and parallel a new thing, either with like PosiTaps or something. And you have to do the exact same thing for every single balance wire on this connector. Yeah, screw that. I, don't, I, think, people, I think most of the people commenting on this are, think that you're looking at a car battery. They, they don't right. think you were looking at some 25 pin connector. Yeah. Because you would have, because if you have to put 3.7 volts on every single one of these balance wires, mm -hmm. first you'd have to know what each one of the wires is for. Right. So first um, you have to know what each wire is for. Then you'd have to actually put 3.7 volts in or whatever on every mm -hmm. single one of those, plus on here, and then re-insulate the wire after you're done. And also you'd have to make sure that none of these are, are none of these wires are, uh, you'd have to probably like cut at a different point on each one so that they yeah. don't short. It's like... You need like micro posit taps for everything. Yeah, I mean, at that, um, like... <laughs> That, that's not even worth $2,200 in no, my time. No, because no, that would take, and this is not something that you do first explore, like for exploration, and then, oh, I can now do it repeatedly. If you try to do that, it would take you two days straight for every single time you do it, which is not a good use of your time for the sake of replacing a battery. Yeah, because if it's not at the board side, but the BMS side, and you have this connector going into the BMS, you'd have to pretty much tap into it on every single... Right. You know. Now... The thing is, is that, because this is new and no one knows, I don't know if you unplug the BMS from the ESC, if that also breaks it. I don't know. And also, each time you experiment to try to figure this out, that's 2200 here, 2200 Correct. here, 2200 here. And you'd have to find people in the community that are willing to burn $2,200 each time they want to figure out how to do this procedure. And that's going to wind up taking them several days of screwing around and splicing and then re-insulating battery wires after they've spliced it on a connector, not to mention if you want to shorting <laughs> one to the other and it's not polyfused on the inside. Kaboom. Correct. Yeah, so screw that. Yeah, it's 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 not a viable, it's not an economically viable it <laughs> endeavor. Like, it's, it's yeah, it sounds good until you get into it. You want to know something really fun? And okay. this is this has been known in the one wheel modern repair community, which is just joyous. You've 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 worked on batteries. You have your bike, right? Yeah. So you know how red is positive and black is negative. Mm -hmm. You know how on XT connectors the flat side is positive and it's marked. Yeah, it's backwards. Flat side is negative. Dude, this what the. This has been the case since the very first one wheel, the oh, original one. Are you serious? There are, there, are, there are conspiracy theories. I don't have aluminum foil to do the hat thing, but there are conspiracy theories as to why. The best one I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, it's probably not, it's very much apocryphal, is that when they first did it, because the initial Kickstarter one wheel release production thing was very, you know, by the, by the seat of our pants kind of thing, that the factory just screwed this up 
and all of their production files were like this from a prototype or something, and they just ran with it forever because it's like, well, that's what it is. But the thing is, this XT60 connector being the main terminal of the battery, people who, who work on one wheels learn this one of two ways. Someone I know tells which way I'd learn it. That's the second I know which way. way I'd learn it. The first way is someone tells you, and then you go, wait, what? Oh my God, you are not kidding. And then they go, I know. Or, I know which way I'd learn it. You were like, oh my God, thank goodness. I live in Malta and my one wheel doesn't work. And I fortunately have the cells I need and I've made a new battery and I go to plug it in. And then you get that wonderful magic smoke and a pop. And then you go, you uh, yeah. You, either, you, you, you take your bucket of sand next to you, you, turn, you toss it on the <laughs> desk, throw you it run. Outside. You run. So what I wanted to go over with you really yes. for a while is uh, the list of grievances, because you said this is kind of like the last... Uh, yeah, the, the, the GT release, it, it's so bittersweet. I don't even know what, what figure of speech to use. Double-edged sword, bittersweet. Cause last mine, nail in the coffin. I want to go back to the yeah. nail, and I want to go over them with you. Sure. You know, so before we get into the nitty-gritty, because I, I try very much to avoid overtly negative stuff like on my channel, because why bother? Um... The GT, I got one that works. Many people did not. And so, A, there's kind of like a, almost like survivor's guilt. It's like, I feel like a dick uh, riding around and making content on my GT that works. Meanwhile, someone's like waiting for their second board because their first one either rode into a wall or whatever. Um, but it functions. Like when it works, the performance is great. It rides great. As a one wheel person, which I won't bother getting into now because it's a whole emotional connection to the way it rides. As a one-wheel person, the GT performs really well. I got on it and, you know, thanked my lucky stars that mine worked and didn't run away from me. And when I was riding it, it was euphoric. Like, it worked great. And then when you get into everything behind it, it just, it like breaks your heart a little bit. It's like, wow. It, 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 you know, you feel almost kind of like yucky, like loving something so much that represents something behind it that's just not so great, you know? And, and so it, it, yeah, it's, it's why I've been less shy about, I also ride electric skateboards with a remote and I fix other stuff. It's like why I've been more comfortable being like, I'm not just a one wheel person. There is greener, there are greener pastures outside of this one particular board with companies that treat repair and modification and customization much more with respect and with like the kind of prestige that it deserves. Um, which you can get into later if you want, but uh, let's, let's start doing the nail thing if you'd like. Yeah. That, that's actually a great book to have had in view for, <laughs> I like, but you said you try to keep negative things off your channel. Not oh. a, that, that is so true that he actually has that book right outside <laughs> of you. <laughs> um, this is, uh, uh, do, you, do you remember that you do, do you know the author? Uh, he wrote this is a, a second book he wrote um the art of not giving a shit i gotta read that um it's just an orange cover and this one is really good about managing like your expectations of the world and hope and all that stuff really good and so i kind of keep it there as like a visual marker like a cue in the background i like it <laughs> so yeah a lot of people were saying that they were getting dead on arrival gts so does anybody know what it is that causes them to be dead because with macbooks every now and then we'll have like one person show up at this random crashing thing and then a year later, it'll be, you know, two people a week, and then it's 20 people a week, and then it's 80. And then after banging our head against the wall for three or six months, we'll finally figure out what it is, and then there'll be some sort of common flaw. Has anybody figured out what that is with the one-wheel GT? The prevailing theory, and it seems to line up, is that it's a firmware issue. It's a, it's a, it has an issue booting up. You know, so every, even electric skateboards where you, you see how fast you press a button and you just go. Um, there is a boot up sequence, and in the there is an open source motor controller that I put into most like high end skateboards. It itself has a boot up sequence, and that can become corrupted. But the thing is, with an open source motor controller like a Vesk, I'll like, I can explain that later, but it's not worth getting into now. You can reflash the firmware. You can reflash the bootloader from a computer. And I can do that on my e-bike motor control. I can flash the firmware onto it, and I can edit everything on it if I want to. Exactly. Settings, current limits, all that stuff. You can do that on like the open Pit source. Exactly. Which that's is... That's the fun comes in. But. Yeah, the, that's one of the secret things, secret sauces of the one wheel, is that it's not just a standard PID loop. It's, it's like a dynamic PID loop that shifts 
and it uses current sensing to shift it to like it's it's insanely complex which is why they ride the way they do for those that don't um, know what that is that's kind of what controls the ride like you know how, how does it accelerate and all that kind of fun stuff exactly um so it seems to be that the doa thing is a firmware thing which and and so it just doesn't get through the boot up sequence and so it shuts itself off which is why a lot of doas you'll press the button you'll see kind of a green flicker and then it, it's gone so why do you have to ship a 30 pound device all the way back to one service center instead of plug it into your computer and run some basic utility? Two reasons. Um, so one is, um, it's one of those things, like once you say it and you speak it out, it's like, oh, that makes sense. Um, you can't do an over-the-air update through the app because um, it just won't turn on. Um, and so they have, I mean, they have their own specialized jigs that they plug a controller into and reflash firmware. Um, so that's why they want you to send it back because it won't turn on. They'll pop the controller box open and blah, 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 blah. My last two e-bike motor controllers have a USB to serial. It's like a USB to serial cable and I plug it in and then I can run the flashing software. Right. That would be the convenient way. So um, well, why doesn't... I don't know. Uh, I brought it out here. Where is it? Hold on. It's like a three hundred dollar motor controller, and it has a little USB to serial, and I can just plug it in. And oh yeah, that would be the ideal way to do it. I have an open source motor controller that I just tossed somewhere. Uh, well, here's so a... this doesn't have any of this, anything. No. Like so this is a this one's broken, but this is a a dual. So this controls two motors, mm -hmm. and there's a USB C port right there. Right. And you j if if it gets all screwed up, it's also you can. This is the Bluetooth module. So you could pop this thing out, and there's a UART port and some extra pins in there. So if the bootloader screwed up and you can't even get into the app to just upload any or re-update anything, you can just use a, an ST link and reflash everything there. So there's so no reflashing of anything on this if it ever gets corrupted or anything, you have to send it back to the manufacturer. Correct. Do no no end user anything. Do they make the firmware available to any other repair shop or even author? Is there a such thing as an authorized repair shop network or whatever? Or is it literally just you have to send it back to this one service center if you have corrupt firmware? Yeah, that, that last thing. Even, even if you're an international customer. Is if, there a port on this? Like even on the inside, if you open it up, I know it's probably not on the outside. Is there like a, oh, you, there's no. Yes. There's nothing? Kind of. Kind of. Okay, explain there, what kind of. <laughs> There, okay, so on, I haven't opened that one up, so I can't speak for the GT. Okay. But on the XR controller, there are ports, uh, not like a plug-in port, they're like pads. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back, if you care to, old Future Motion videos, like where Adam Savage toured their factory, you can see what the jigs look like. They custom make jigs to flash firmware, to test things, they put motors in it, do all that stuff. Very wonderful stuff. And so the the port on their controllers and BMSs are pads. And so you install it into the jig and you clamp it in and the jig itself has the pins that engage with the pads and that's how you interact with it. Um, no firmware has been made available and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if there's any software issue or the PCB breaks, it goes back. And if you live elsewhere outside of the US, you got to figure out how to do that effectively. And shipping this is not going to be fun, especially having to declare the battery. Yeah, we can, um, we can also, if you want, get into battery stuff, or if you have more nails you'd like to I imagine in. I'd like to get into the battery stuff and the nails like 50-50, I'd say. Okay, so the battery thing is actually very simple. I kind of laid it out before you got here in a fit of starstruck panic. Um, so this is an XR battery that someone dropped off just to have re like rebuilt, mm -hmm. right? So not going to bother building a new one from scratch because it's easy and salvageable, all the other stuff in it. And the XR was made with two different kinds of cells. The Samsung 30Q, which for a long time was like the du jour cell to use in DIY electric skateboards. Yeah, they're high output, but lower doesn't yeah, they go out it's, of balance is easier and they don't last as long. Yeah, they're mildly inconsistent. And then they shifted to the Murata VTC6, which many people call the Sony VTC6, but Sony has long since sold off their cell division. So it was bought up by Murata, but it's these. Green cells. Same spec, three amp hours per cell, and then they have their current discharge rating, like max before they overheat and all that good stuff. So this is an older pink cell, Samsung 30Qs, and it's gonna be rebuilt with VTC6s, which is what's in my XR now. Mm -hmm. And they work wonderfully, they're like magic. Um, not really. So this is an XR battery. All I did was cut the blue heat shrink, and it's foam like high density, closed cell foam, fine. I'm gonna zoom in on this. Sure. I, I, sorry, I left the GT, this 32 pound monstrosity right in his way. Hey, as long as it doesn't uh, run into me, I'm good. 
we can talk about the 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 ghosting issues too that's a fun that's a fun topic <laughs> okay let's get this on the all right yeah so one wheel xr pack now granted this is the former flagship uh -huh. but looking at the batteries because i've rebuilt a couple for the pint which is their current gen um, they're, they're not different in construction, quite honestly. So all I did was cut this blue stuff. This is PVC heat shrink and it comes off and PVC, PVC shrink heat shrink is, that's fine. It's not a mystery. It holds everything together. This is what will go on it. It's, I buy it by the roll. It's not magic. This is the inside of the battery. It is 30 Samsung 30 Qs. 15 in series, each parallel group is too wide. So it's 15 S, 2 P. And so it's so 60 volts. Uh, yeah. Max charge voltage is 63 okay. and nominal is 54, whatever. And they're sitting in a plastic frame, which is good because they're spaced out properly. And you've got an insulated adhesive plastic on the top and the bottom. And uh, can we take this off without Ruining it. This does not look bad, but this no. does not okay, look so. like some sort of alien technology that no. is so much better than what anybody else could ever produce in their life kind of thing. You know? No, it is not. Now, it is convenient that since it is a custom large production thing, they have nickel, which is custom cut. But really, I'm not even going to bother because that's going to take forever. So you've got these cells, two by two, mm -hmm. going in series from negative to the positive, And they're connected with nickel. I believe it's 0.15 millimeters thick, whatever. And it's connected and it makes its main circuit, which is what this is connected to, top and bottom. And along each P group is a wire and it senses the voltage of each individual cell group. And that's how the BMS balances, manages, evens the pack voltage out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all it is. The balance wiring runs across here and there are little nickel tabs that each thing is soldered into. And that's it. So the cells, when we talk about the highest quality of cells, Samsung 30Qs are a little bit hard to get sometimes. I like, I like 30Q. I just don't like having to open my pack up every nine months to rebalance the like every other pack that I have that just doesn't need that. If you like 30Qs and you don't want to do that, you can spend a little extra money and get some VTC6s. Um, but yeah, so even though these are 30Qs, also the current spec for the XR before it went out, was the VTC6, and there are 30 of them here. Yeah, I have a 14 series, uh, nine parallel uh, 30Q pack, and it's able to put out like 3,000, uh, yeah, 3,500 watts. It's, that's a chunky uh, battery. It's, it's beautiful. Ooh. I, Do that Tim the Toolman Taylor thing, like, ar, ar, ar. I wish. Um, so the stuff that's around here is fiberglass reinforced tape, hmm. and it's usually structural, like you pull it real tight, mm -hmm. and that way this thing won't wiggle apart. That is right here. And you have that? Yes. Yeah, Anyone can buy this. This is not this. something that is special. No, it is not. Because is. when you read the Future Motion post, they make it sound like you can't buy this. You need to have your own mining company to get this little <laughs> unobtainium mineral that they're putting into their battery. But exactly. in reality, they're using a stock, a basic stock tape, 30Q yeah, like, cells that anybody can buy, and if, an XD60 that anybody can buy. Now, don't do this at home. I just kind of know where to cut. Oh, no. See, this oh, is the thing. Explode. Now, oh, I see no. this I actually hate to do because this is my nice pocket knife, and fiberglass tape destroys the edges of a knife. I learned that the hard way. But you can look, it's just fiberglass tape. And those are cells, which are potentially dangerous if you don't know what you're doing, but anyone can learn to know what they're doing. And those are the balance wires. And that's the thing, they don't get the idea that anybody can learn, can, can, can learn what they're doing. Right, even the balance wires is 26 gauge PVC coated wire, which is here. Um, I don't even use this for the battery packs because I don't like how not robust that insulation is i use ptfe teflon insulated wire because it's really hard to damage so even if you don't route your wires perfectly the odds that the insulation will wear out and short is much lower than on the stock battery so there's that the frames are plastic i've 3d printed these before because the file is available like someone just redrew it and it'll fit perfectly this is this is another oddity this is 13 gauge silicone wire mm -hmm which is a little bit odd. Usually I like silicon wire because it's so flexible. Oh, yeah. it feels so nice. It does. I don't have any 13 gauge, so I use 12, which is a little bit thicker. I didn't know they made, I didn't know they made odd gauged wire before. Me neither. The battery welder I use, um, the connection from the input like the actual car battery I use to run it is 7 gauge. 
which is weird. I'm like, oh, that's okay. I never knew they made odd gauge wire before. I learned something. I know. It's it's so weird. I only really see it in very specific instances in like imported products. So one of the things that you said is that their battery is it's not bad. It's average run of the mill. Um, what makes yours different than this? Because you, well, aside from the fact that I suffer from a horrible case of anxiety, so every single thing that I either solder or weld is looked at for a long time before I'm comfortable handing it off to somebody else. That's that's one of the things. Because there's a there's a battery building community. You know, there are custom battery builders that build stuff for e-bikes, scooters, electric skateboards. Occasionally, we kind of work on one-wheel stuff, although there are two major companies. There's JW Batteries, who you know about. Yeah. And then there's Shy Battery in Chicago. They're kind of like the one-wheel battery mod people. So I don't really go into their territory with expanded batteries. I'm very much like someone in New York City, their battery's dead. I'll make you a new one for like 200 bucks. Meanwhile, if you send it back and it's only your battery that's dead, it'll cost you like four or 450. Because really these cells, five, six bucks a piece. Nickel is, you just buy it from like large suppliers. I buy them by the kilo. Like I got like 10 kilos of different kinds of nickel down there. And you cut it, you shape it, you weld it, you inspect each weld, you're comfortable with it, you make your circuit, you prep your harness, you solder it with a cartridge-based soldering iron, <laughs> right? <laughs> I like it. With different tips, which works better than those old $500 non-cartridge styles. Fume extractor, respirator over there so I don't die, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you need to remake it, if you were either paranoid or smart, you stocked up on these because you can't get them. But there's nothing magical about this. It's just a battery. And, and there couldn't be, because they would have to redesign the idea of how lithium ion batteries work in a PAV for it to be so special that any person with an ounce of care or you know sense of discovery could do. Um, I've got batteries I could show you, maybe not now, that function exactly the same way. Actually, I will, just one second. Go for it. Um, this is a custom I'm building for a friend of mine. And the shape is different, but the theory is the same. So this is an under tray for an electric skateboard. This and is this cool. Is, is a 12, I like this. Yeah. It, 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 these, like, these electric skateboard batteries always look pretty on top before you kind of cover them up. And this is a 12S4P made of Molly Cell P42A. This is the BMS, which cost about 20 bucks. For a 12S, I have some BMSs to show you over there that are quite special. And it's the main circuit from negative in a U shape to the positive. And you've got balance wire connected to each individual series jumper or bridge. And there's a little foam between it because this is kind of mildly going to flex under the deck. You know, it's got like that little bounce to it. And this is the balance connector. It will connect into this and discharge into the ESC remote blah, 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 and there you go. The, the theory behind that battery is damn near identical to every single lithium ion battery. They are just built the same because they cannot be built any other way if you're going to use these cylindrical lithium ion cells. That's just the reality of it. So there's my spiel. Also, XC60 connectors which you can wire normally or if you're building a one-wheel battery in reverse. Without. I would probably wire that the wrong way and let out smoke. I get cuz I would never imagine that you would get something like that wrong. Battery fires can be quite interesting to watch when they're outside. Less interesting to watch when they're inside. Even when they're outside the smell is not particularly enjoyable. Oh yeah, you don't want to breathe that. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> watch my video on watch my video on the on the fire bag test. That one was a lot of so fun. You, you said you've done videos on how to prevent fires with these batteries and what to do in case of a fire, which is surprising to yes. me because if I were to listen to Future Motion, I would think that if anything, you would be the one setting the fires and tr trying to make these go on fire because you're the one that's making it unsafe. Yeah, battery fires are a very interesting beast for a couple of different reasons. One, when they do happen, they are severe, really severe, extremely violent. A lot of folks who are into like hobbyist stuff have seen like lipo fires because and those are pretty easy to do. You poke a lipo battery through the pouch and it's gone. You have to do a lot more to a lithium ion battery made of cylindrical cells to get it to combust. The unfortunate thing is once you've reached that point, you can't stop it. You just can't. There's oxygen in the chemistry. And once that decomposes and the oxygen is freed, this could be in a vacuum and it will flame. So that's the scary part. But you do have to do a lot, a lot to get it to that point. 
the battery I blew up in testing that fireproof bag. I used cartridge heaters throughout it. And so it was like almost 300 watts of heat on that battery for five minutes before it started to combust. And once it does, you can't stop it. That's it. You have to wait for the chemistry to burn itself out. But you have to abuse and misuse a battery a lot or build it horribly, really horribly. And I have seen horribly built batteries. And it's usually a small percentage. No, <laughs> there are a lot of DIY builders that build really bad batteries, but it's a result of them not asking the right people, the right questions, seeing pictures, watching videos and be like, oh, I could do that, but not digging deep enough because there's not the respect of the potential danger. Lithium, ba lithium ion batteries are like a car parked in the garage. They're fine. They're not harming anyone. But if you put an idiot behind the wheel with like a flamethrower in the trunk, it can be potentially very, very dangerous. But the truth about it is with a modicum of respect and this desire to do things properly and have like a feeling of craftsmanship behind the stuff that you build, it's very easy to jump that barrier from what I just made is a bomb and what I've made will last me for two to three years. Yeah, and what's, what bothers me is when, even if you were to make the argument that, well, with a car, you mm -hmm. have to get a license, you can't just drive it, we give you that opportunity to get a license. We give you that opportunity to read the state driver's manual, to understand what all the signs mean, to understand what the potential dangers are, to take a defensive driving class. And so many of these companies, there's no, there's just no opportunity. Right. Like there's nothing that you could do to prove to anyone, to this company, that you can replace the battery in a GT. No. It doesn't matter. You can get a PhD. You could, you, you know, you could have been the person at I don't know, Exxon that introduced a lithium-ion battery idea right. in the 70s. It wouldn't matter. And with many companies that make products like this, there's pretty much nothing you could do to convince any of them to take away these fe the, you know, those features that will kill the board if you try to just unplug the battery. Correct. Which is, I don't need to tell you this. It's too far it, in the other direction. It's ridiculous. Um, I mean, there's a mechanic that we take our cars to right down the road. Fixes all of them. And they are not mechanical engineers. They're mechanics. And... You know, one's ability to have the title of I'm an engineer and I have have this formal training, it, it doesn't preclude you from being any kind of mechanic. You know, what makes a mechanic a really good mechanic is experience, the stuff that they've seen. You know, when you take your car to someone, you're like, I don't know what the hell this noise is. And they go, oh, yeah, I see that all the time. They fix it. You're on your way. You know, it's that experience of, of just being hands on with something in a mechanical way that that gives you the expertise to look at something that's broken and know what the hell to do about it. And the same thing goes with building a battery. The fact that they're all constructed under the same theory means that once you really internalize how batteries are built and the safety procedures and dealing with insulation and trying to foresee how this thing is going to be abused, once you really get that in the back of your head, any battery configuration falls under the same umbrella. Like I could make a one wheel battery as safe as I can make an e-bike battery, as safe as I can make an electric skateboard battery, you know, because the principles of insulation, knowing where to insulate, where abrasion is going to happen, where vibration would enhance the, vi the abrasion. These are just things you do, like, like you learn by collaborating with people, seeing how it's done, trying it, screwing it up, blah, 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 blah. I destroyed a lot of batteries before I ever built anything that I felt comfortable another person having. Yeah, know? opening up the EM3 V battery that I looked at for my own bike was amazing. You had li liquid proofing, you had, um, nice. the, uh, there was foam and padding on all the sides, numerous different layers, different temperature sensors everywhere, mm -hmm. polyfuses on all the different rows of cells, a polyfuse on the output after that, just mm -hmm. because they're paranoid about what could happen. Yeah. It's, and then the other batteries you open were just, a bunch of cells that are held together with a roll of tape, and that's it. Yeah, and, and, and you can open up a battery, and it makes sense to you. Like, you can see, oh, that's obviously garbage. Or you can look at this and go, oh, I, that, everything that they did there makes sense. I've it's learned to open up every single battery to any electric uh, bike thing or anything that I get before I start using it now. Careful with the higher voltages. I've been bitten a couple times. There because was... I bought from companies that, sold, that said, we're going to sell you this cell if you pay an additional two or $400. Thank you. Uh, and they wind up, but then when you actually get it, it's a different cell entirely, and it's a no-name generic brand. Which is, yeah, that's that's rough. Especially when they charge you for it. Oh yeah, that that that's a big no-no. Um, I've had instances where a customer will request a certain battery cell, and either I can't get it or I don't want to use it. Um, like I had asked for Samsung 35e, and what I got was 
Whatever. Smegma or whatever that is. <laughs> I don't know. You did not but just say It smegma. wasn't a Samsung 35E. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. So, the, I mean, the thing is, when, when that happens to most battery builders, like small, local, really, you know, salt of the earth kind of battery builders, uh, they'll often then have a conversation. Like, if you request a 35E, they'll say, well, the 35E by today's standards kind of sucks. Um, you should go with the Molisel M35A. Same exact spec, longer cycle life, slightly lower, I think, internal resistance, so it'll sag less towards the bottom. And it actually will cost you about a dollar less per cell. That's a good conversation to have. Right. And so, you know, there's a board over there, old board. I think it's like six years old. Batteries toast. A Samsung 30Q's in there. And there's, a, and there's a cell that I just adore, the Mollus LP28A. It's got 200 milliamp hours less capacity, but the discharge ceiling is so much higher that by the time you get to 20, 10%, the sag is so much less that you end up getting more range. Hmm. Because before it, le- it reaches that low voltage cutoff, it, like, it, it, it won't pull it down with a hard like current draw. I can tell far. that you've looked at several graphs on this and tried it and everything. And yeah, you're, I need, you're like a cell enthusiast. You know the difference between them all. I need to give a shout out to someone who's like integral to like PEV batteries. Um, and he also lives in Manhattan. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen him, Battery Mooch. Haven't, but I'll look him up. He's like Cell Jesus. He's like Battery Christ. Um, he's a gentleman for for decades has been like designing BMSs. He does consulting, and he tests every single cell. He's also like a vape guy, and so he's like on the eSig forums and stuff like that. And so he has lab equipment because it's his literal career, and he tests every single cell. Every single cell. I'm talking torture tests. And he does graphs. He records. Here's what the discharge curve looks like at 10 amp draw, 20 amp draw, 5 amp draw. Here's what the manufacturer states the, the ratings are for capacity and discharge. Here's the actual one. Like, yeah, here's what I... And, and many times, especially for a cell like, you know, the VTC6 and 30Q, like they usually match up. Sometimes they don't. And he's the person who publishes all this stuff, publishes all the data, publishes his testing setup. And, and he, if, if there's an enthusiast conversation about what cells to use, it's usually based off of his data. Pretty much 99% of the time. Um, I knew about him because I was a big flashlight guy. So, you know, like you get like those high powered, like paint the sky with like the, the beam throwers. And so you would like what kind of cell will run without the rest of the body getting hot. And they would always find data from like, you know, cell tests. Half the time they'd be his. And he's been really involved in like the DIY community and just basically wanting people to be able to have the information to make safe choices. So they're not overdrawing a cell and the cell is the reason that you've got heat, which leads to fire. And so... Yeah, when it comes to conversations about what cells to use in whatever the hell you're building or fixing, it's almost always because of his data. Uh, he's probably the; those are probably his graphs that I saw posted to Endless Sphere too. Yes, I was reading the Endless Sphere forums a lot. I'm definitely certain they were. I saw the 35E had less output, but since I was I had five batteries, I just didn't. It doesn't matter. Yeah, at that point, it's like you have enough. <laughs> Usually, if you, I mean any, any cell that has like some sag, you parallel enough of them. I wanted to try fine. to hit 300 miles within it within a, one electric bicycle. How can and, you sit for that long? <laughs> There are folks who do like long range rides on like e skates and one wheels, and they're like, I did 100 miles, I got batteries everywhere. I don't know how they stand for that long. I'm like done after like 15, 20 miles. I'm like, I want to be home. I just wanted to say that I did it. <laughs> no other reason. That's a good enough reason to do anything, just to say that I did it. So uh, you had said that there, you had given certain advice on how to deal with these things if you are one of those people that had one go on fire. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's a tough. That's a, that is a topic. Because here's the thing: is there anything other than jump and run away? Like for, for my for the office, it's have a in, have a oil waste container and have a giant pile of sand. So like, so if we were replacing a battery in the store, you have your your waste container and a pile of sand. If I'm outside and this happens, I run. Like that's, yeah, okay. A... If you are outside and you're not around like something very flammable, then you have no choice. You can't really touch it once it starts to go off. Um, Inside, it depends on what the battery is. If it's like a laptop or a small device battery, it's not likely to burn your house down unless you charge your laptop and phone on like a bed of newspaper and you're asleep and it goes Next off. To an oil canister. Next, right. Um, the thing is, is that, and this is also a fun safety bit, this battery is 324 watt hours. The battery in the GT, I think, is closer to 500 watt hours. Uh, that battery over there is 1.2 kilowatt hours. I just repaired a LaCroix Lone Star. It's that. It's a 
big long range bar. You're talking like 60 miles of charge. It's a 2.2 kilowatt hour battery. Something like that goes up, you run. Yeah. Even if you're, as in you get the hell out. Because um, between the flame and the fumes, you're, you're done. So anything to do with safety and battery fires has to be preventative. That's why I don't charge anything unless I can supervise it. Like PEV wise, phones, whatever. But if I'm charging my board, one wheel or other, if I'm not around or awake, I don't plug it in. That's it. Full stop. Um, some things you can charge overnight because the systems are just so tried and tested that they're fine, most likely. But anxiety, not for me. If I'm not around, I don't charge it. I also keep everything in here. And when I'm doing like real serious work on something that's a little bit sketchy, the door's open. And if anything doesn't look good or there's a pop, which sucks when something like sounds like a pop, but it's not. You know, I've had things like fall in the distance and I'm like, oh crap, is that the battery I'm working on? <laughs> and I, I, it's like, you know, like, like that, that wide eyed. Yeah, yeah. So the, I, I have magnets here for when I'm like holding nickel on. Sometimes they do uh, like a that. And I didn't know it was that, and then my brain just like. Uh, after wait. my experience with the unit pack power set, where I I where saw I, that I, video. yeah, I paid the extra for thirty five e, and what I got was again I don't know smegma whatever. <laughs> I, every time I'd hear like if I heard a car make a noise outside, I turn around and go, "Is that my right? Is that my bike?" Yeah, it's just that. Yeah, so it, it has to be preventative. If you live in an apartment building, and you're gonna have a PV with a large battery, and you're not a hundred percent certain that it was from a really good manufacturer. You have to have a plan of where you're going to stash it and charge it. I charged it uh, locked to a gate outside with an exten- uh, a heavy-duty extension cord that was about 25 feet going down my window. Was it like waterproof? It was. Oh, good. Because water damage can lead to certain bad things. Uh, oh, no, I have a motorcycle cover that I was putting over it that, so that there was no liquid on it. But the batteries that they make now, EM3V changed it from the older models when they used to have a soft case to hard case to mm-hmm. liquid, really liquid-proof. The, uh, That's a good idea. So, um, so yeah, it... It, it, all the safety stuff is always just preventative. So, you know, have an exit plan, basically. Going back to some nails, because every single time yeah. I do a video, somebody mentions, wait till he finds this. Or like when I mention something, they'll go, wait till he finds the, pi- I don't know, the pint charge connector inside the PCB. And I wind up looking at this oh, and going, we can talk are you about serious? That. We can talk like, about Why that. are you using a connector that's this tiny to charge a battery? Or like, I'm sure that there's a bunch more that I'm missing. Somebody mm. said, make sure when you talk to Mario, ask about error 23. Yeah. Which one's that? There's so many errors. I saw like an error 156 or something on the GT. So I, I don't know if that was real. The nails in the coffin for okay. you. Yes. Go, let's, let's go over these nails together. My pleasure. You want me to like, do you want to lead or do you want me to just like... I don't know what them? all the nails are because I, like, I, I, I know what they I, are from my I, industry. I prepped some stuff for you. Okay. Wait, is that it? Yes. Okay. Pint charge connector. This is an old pint box that came off of a fix. A uh, person wanted to mod it, did, then changed their mind, and so they swapped boxes. So this is that connector you were talking about. Oddly enough, the crimp, the little wing that holds it in, came off. So is this you, is for charging. A, this is, is this for charging the battery or discharging? This is battery? charging. So this is the charge port. The charge port on the pint is standardized. It's a GX12 two pin. Look at this. Okay, just to give you an idea, because I don't think in any of my earlier videos I did. Yeah. So now you can you can see exactly. This how, is my pinky. This is the charge connector. It's not very bang. Dude. My, my pinky fingernail is twice as big as this. Right. So, that being serious? said... Okay, so... The pint, I got what one. What a piece of shit. Ooh, something. What a fucking piece of... All right. Uh, this is a pint. This is a modded pint. This is the only currently modded board I have. So look at how big this board is. Look, the board is itself like... is tiny. And for safety, because we are qualified engineers... You charge the battery of this thing with this. Sweet mercy indeed, Paul Daniels. <laughs> Is that really Paul Daniels? Yeah, I, oh I stole his, uh, his noise. Thanks for bringing our fight to the masses. We want Future Motion to remove all pairing locks, amp hour usage restrictions, and bricking countermeasures from all one-wheel waddles. We won't go away until they do. Yeah, we were talking about the amp hour usage restrictions, where if you put a higher spec battery in there or a better battery, you still won't get to use the benefit of it. No. Which is... And... and, and like I mentioned before, you know, in terms of using extended range batteries, it's not really my thing. Um, like if I want to ride for 50 miles, I'll ride like a very large board that I could sit down on after 20 miles. Um, so that's not, but, but that's not really the point. The point is, is that, you know, you even if, be able to. yeah, exactly. Even if I like my XR, there's no good reason for it. No. And, and the issue that really broke my heart was that forever, 
and this is this is something interesting to think about. Like forever, I wasn't really in the whole fight of right to modify. It was always just right to repair because my XR means the world to me. And so the battery wore out and I made a new one and now I've got another four years out of it. And that is not the case with the GT. If it wears out, that's it. And they've discontinued the original one, naturally. They've discontinued the Plus, which was the second one wheel model. And they don't support those anymore. And it, in effect, it doesn't matter because you can mod those easily. You can build a new battery. You can run the Plus and the original one without a BMS, which is what you can do with most like higher end custom PEVs. You just plug in a input, power input to the ESC and it'll just work. Um, but after that, like you can't. The GT, eventually, I imagine, it'll be discontinued with whatever else they've come out with. And if they stop supporting it, that's it. That's it. Like it's, it, it's bricked. Like I try to build a new battery, it is bricked because as we talked about, it's not practical to parallel a new battery into it. This, so back onto the charge, this is the tangents. This is an externally modded thing, but this can be entirely reversed. There was no positive, like permanent cuts into this. What you is can, this is a battery? Yeah, this is an external battery. This is actually a very popular mod for a lot of one wheel folks. Did you make this battery? No, this is made by a company. It's called a GT40 mod. It fits perfectly over the arch of the wheel. That's yeah. I that's have a, nice. I have a broken one. Um, I did a review on this, and so I did something that they said I shouldn't do, and uh, what they said would happen happened. I broke it. What did you do? Um, you can't. You shouldn't hot plug it. So you shouldn't plug it in because this is running parallel to the main power input to the ESC, and so you shouldn't un. You shouldn't Tell plug it in. Tire warranty, Mario. Oh, oh okay. that, that'll oh. be the next nail. Okay. We have forty. We have we have a half hour left to go over all these nails. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, anyway, it runs in parallel. You shouldn't hot plug it or hot because then it'll fry the internal BMS. I did that what they said would happen would happen and so this is so you can look at what's inside they custom machined a aluminum case and they put 15 cells in here and so you run this effectively gives you an extra parallel group so it reduces sag because you're drawing current from two different sources increases your range by a whole lot and so that's that but you can we have to charge it on the board so this thing as a pint charges at a max of about three amps the stock charger is 1.2 amps, and it's the same on the Pint X, which is this thing. And how many cells are in parallel on this again? In this, inside the tail is one. It's a 15S1P. And this is another 15S1P. Wait, so only one parallel? Yeah. This is their... Okay, so that is actually kind of fast. So 3, three amps is fast charging for that. Yeah, I mean, the cell in there, the cell in the Pint, the regular Pint, that's 1P, is a VTC 5D. I charge each of mine at four amps, but it's like six to seven parallel for the newer packs I got and nine for the older. So that's, right. it's yeah, a, that is, that's considered fast charging for this thing. Right, but the thing is, is that the charging bottleneck has never been the cells. Because the VTC 5D can charge at like four to five amps, if that's what the spec is for fast charging. Mm -hmm. um, the Pint X is a VTC 6, and it's the same battery as the XR, it's 15S2P. But since everything else inside of it is the same, you can still only charge it at a max of three amps. The the BMS won't accept fast. So you said how, how many? So this is this is four fifteen. So that that's about 60, 61 volts, sixty two volts max. More or less, yeah. So sixty two volts, three amps is going through this. Yeah, now, well, just a question because I'm, I'm I'm ignorant. When it comes to the, char the ch charging it at three amps, is that something that is an aftermarket thing somebody put out, or is that something that you're allowed to do according to the manual of this device? You can charge. So so they sell. They always sell with every board two two chargers, the so regular one and the fast charger. So they sell a fast charger. So it's not like you're charging it at three amps instead of the spec one one amp. They they sell a charger for three amps. And they designed it with this connector. Well, so here's the thing. Um, the <laughs> I need that. Those things are hard to find. I, I see. No, but <laughs> you can't just throw one wheel parts everywhere. <laughs> this thing's probably worth like a hundred dollars because no one has been able to tell me the part number of this. So I need this. If I can only find another one of these crimps, I am golden. That's another repair right there. <laughs> it's like bread during the Great Depression. Um, so they sell a 3 amp charger. That's their ultra charger. There are aftermarket chargers that charge at 3.5 amps, which is a little bit faster. And I don't know if 3 amps will eventually burn this out or if 3.5 is just too far because I haven't tested it yet. I can because I could hook it up, like short it through the power supply and just run 3 amps and see what it does after like 10 hours and then do it at 3.5 and see if that's actually the ceiling. But I don't wanna, cause I need this. That's a laptop fan connector. 
if it's literally a laptop fan that connectors, like, I will take all the laptop fans you have. No, like this is. I I get that somebody said that this connector is spec for three amps, but mm-hmm. looking at it, I would never see that. That is my completely not not barely graduated high school, not engineer point of view. This looks like it's for a laptop fan. Yeah, because I said that that was looks like an A eleven eighty one inverter board connector. This actually looks smaller than an A eleven eighty one inverter board connector. So that that's that that's a grievance that people have with this. And yeah. have you had to replace any of those, or has that been part? Of, did you primarily focus on batteries, or have you? Had I a- I really primarily focus on batteries because uh, the issue with repairing one wheels is that if you're an independent shop and you want to fix a one wheel, you only have like three real options. If there's a PCB issue, you can send it back to Future Motion, and they'll replace the PCB, whether it's a BMS or the motor controller. If you don't do that. Uh, there's a second option. I think there are maybe, I only know of three people on earth that do component level repair of future motion PCBs. And there are only certain ones that they can do like MOSFETs, resistors, et cetera, et cetera. If you blow a hole through the MCU and the BMS, you're screwed because no one has the firmware to re-upload onto it. Um, there's one guy in the EU and I think there are one or two in the U S they don't interface directly with customers. It's like, you know, through all the repair shops, they'll arrange, you know, so they'll like say, Oh, this actually can be repaired. We'll send it off. Um, so that's option number two, which takes forever and is not cheap because a guy has to sit there with his microscope and look at the board and figure out what he needs to replace and then source those and blah, 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 because they're hard to get. And then there's option number three, which is really what has been the case for the last few years is you pull parts from an existing working one wheel. That's yeah, that's what we're doing with the new MacBooks because you can't find a lot of the chips anywhere, and there's no schematic release for some of them. So that you you don't you, like if you have this little square above the CD thirty two seventeen is burned. What is that? I don't know. Yeah, you, know, you have to grab it from something else, and that something else you're grabbing it from may have been tossed in the garbage as a donor board because the piece that you're taking off of it is the one that's bad. Yeah, so and it's it's very in- aggravating. Aggravating. And- it is because what happens and what literally has happened, and this is also quite heartbreaking, is that repair shops become like air sets chop shops and you can and because someone has a board that needs parts someone will just part it out and sell it here's the entire controller box here's the entire battery box here's the motor 500 400 like so remember i mentioned hardware revisions like before they started like limiting your battery Mm -hmm. so this is a 4208 the ones that allowed you to just straight up without any mod chips put in an extended battery are 4206, 08, and 10, some firmwares. Those BMSs sell on the secondary market for like four to six hundred dollars. Because As, you're allowed to, yes. to have an uh, if I didn't if I didn't still love this board, I could gut this thing, sell the motor controller for like five hundred and fifty dollars, the e uh, the the BMS for like four to six hundred, the motor for four, blah blah blah, and recoup most of what I paid new for this thing four years ago. Because they're rare. Once they break in certain ways, they're done. They're e waste, they're trash. Um, and uh, naturally you can't buy the PCB. And they ended up, especially with the pint, serializing the BMS and controller. Bro, so if so Thanks. if the BMS burns out on this, I have to find someone who chopped up their pint and buy a new BMS and the matching serialized controller. So you can't what what does the BMS have to do with the controller? Like I don't understand because the a battery and a controller just seems like totally separate things. Mm. Another compli- See, that's the thing, is that I can't give you like a straight answer. Everything is complicated. And all and it's because of how they're built and because there's that big old area of I don't know. There are a lot of people that have suggested that like a right to repair bill should just like even a basic simple one if, before trying to get past a more difficult one is you can't serialize parts without making if you're gonna do that, you have to make the pairing tool available to the customer or the repair shop. That's it. Just like as one basic bill. The company shouldn't be able to say that even if you actually have the part that you need to do the job, that, that the product that you purchase is going to say, no, I am rejecting you putting an OEM part in there. Because the thing with serialization is that it takes away the entire argument that the part itself is not genuine, that you're not using something genuine, because why do you not work with the genuine part anymore? Right. It destroys their argument. It does. I don't have an answer for you as to why they would have like serialized. There's somebody who, hasn't, who, has, who is not the CEO of Future Motion. Correct. Nails. Like, Nails. We Nails. have 20 minutes to go through some of that. I'm going to try to not go off on tangents. And no then worries. maybe if there's any time left at the end, we can do tangents. Sweet. I want to hear all these nails. Somebody I, talked about a tire. Okay. Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> 
I know. It's one funny. of the funnest things to do when a new one wheel comes out is you get the PDF of it and then you search the word warranty and you see how many times it comes up. Now, I don't know if you've seen much of one wheel riding videos, but one of the things about it that makes it fun is riding off road, doing jumps, all the cool shit that people love to do as a board sport because extreme, right? Um, that will void your warranty. Stunt riding and jumps will void your warranty. Would riding it with a handstand void your warranty? I think that counts as a stunt. They have that in their own promotional video on their own YouTube channel. No comment. This is uh, the manual for the Pine X. Nice. I you sound like the CEO. Uh, listen, <laughs> notice that I keep the manual for the Pine X right next to this book. Everything um, is book. I like yeah, it. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of dig it. But um, the tire warranty. The thing is, it is so weird because they have warranty on specific parts, which in theory makes sense. The wear parts have a shorter warranty. The tire is a wear part, and so it's warranted for six months. The unfortunate reality is, is that so far, for most people, the stock tire is not good. This is not a stock tire. This is a Hoosier go-kart tire, and I will talk about the Hoosier, I mean, the tire size thing in a second. If you change your tire, which pretty much everyone now does, there's a guy who lives in Astoria, Paul, big guy, walking muscle, changes tires by, like, like barehanded. Like, he doesn't use a top bead breaker. He uses one hand and breaks the bead. Fucking animal. Rips the tire off like a bracelet. It comes up, ham fists it back on there, pops the bead, you're done without even unplugging the motor. That the sounds dude, like a beast of a man. When everyone's like, I need a new tire, I, I don't do tire changes anymore. Like, I'm like, go to Paul because you get like dinner and a show. You watch him do it, he, ha he, he does it in 10 minutes without he, like, he's got his whole jig. <laughs> I, like, I have some clips of it. It is such a sight. But if you do that, the motor warranty is void. What the? Now, the manual will say it will avoid your warranty, but it seems in practice it is that they'll warranty different things. So if you change your tire, the warranty on the motor is void. Do you have to mess with the motor to get the, the tire off? You have, to, you have to remove the motor from the frame. Oh. So you've got to drop it out. Um, this is just... I, imagine if, your car, if parts of your car warranty were voided because you replaced your tire. Right. So if you, change, if you change the grip tape, which is a very common thing to do on a skateboard. I would be curious if that's actually legal. I don't know. Because, well, I mean, the thing is, is that, so I don't, I haven't interacted with Future Motion really. Not like on a direct, like I'm standing in front of you Nathan thing. Nathan Proctor, are you paying attention, by the way? <laughs> you know, they've commented on my videos. I, I did a video when they announced the GT and the Pine X. And I did like a technical analysis of what I thought the battery was going to be. And they wrote in it like, we are watching. Like, Because I said, I'm like, I don't really think they're going to watch this. And they just showed up. And they're like, we are watching. I was like, oh, shit. Um, so there's that. But I haven't really interacted with them because they're not going to sell anybody parts. So whatever. If you change the grip tape, which I did on this, you, warn you void the warranty on the foot pad, which is also one of the causes of ghosting. Um, so if you that. do what's necessary to make it not ghost, you void your warranty on your product that you purchased to make it function. The GT like is, is, that's the thing, is that each new release, and also it depends on who you talk to, because different people have gotten different results from different techs at the company, and I don't know if they've more recently been more aligned. I haven't had to send a board to them in maybe like a year or two. Um, so in effect, I don't know. But by the book, if you change your grip tape, you void the warranty on the sensor. The by the book is the what I care about because by the book is what they're allowed to technically do. Right. Like that. That's that's what they're that's what they're allowed to do or, or not allowed to do. Right. That's you know if for instance exactly. like, if the FTC were to look at that and say that was a violation that of Magnus pop? and Moss. That was, a, that yes, was another. That was another. Battery too. Right. I'm like I have to stop leaning on these. But damn since you magnets. said those are 30 cues, I know it can't possibly be. No. But, uh, but I mean, no, that, 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 as long as it's in the book, even if they don't do it that way and they say, no, we're not going to be dicks and do that, they have the right to. And the thing is, they may, under Magnus and Moss, you, you don't have the right to simply void a warranty simply because you, you have to prove that the person screwed something up. Right. The, the, the onus is on the manufacturer to say, when you replace this tire, when you took the motor out, you took the motor out with a butter knife. Or you took the motor out with, I don't know, a scissor or something, and you cut through the wires. And that's why we're not warranting. You can't simply just avoid it in, without saying, here's what you did. Right. And, that, and that's illegal. But the thing is, is that, and, and, and this is something that gets talked about when it comes to fighting, like what's legal and what's not. And, you know, if, if, if you're a company, right? Now, JW is an oh, exception. So Victory Board Shop, SLS Shop, say hi. Ask Mary about Error 23. You're the third person to tell me to ask about Error 23. Vic when BMS is paired to the controller, you can't swap to a used BMS without using an aftermarket JMW trip. Is that the serialization you were talking about earlier? Wait, when BMS is paired to the controller, you can't swap. Yes, yes. 
Yes, that is that that is it. Thank Vic- you, Victor. Victor is is a friend of mine. Oh, cool. Good. He's he's oh he's a brilliant guy. He also runs a repair shop in Jersey. Um, uh-huh. I think Jersey City. Um, brilliant guy. He also kind of can kind of do component level repair, although he's kind of shying away from it because he realized this is this is why am I doing this? It's like it make you you lose sleep over it. Um, so that tell me yeah about that, it. that that tell me about they, it. it. Not that you would know. Um, <laughs> But no, he's right. Okay, so so that is that leans back to the serialization. If you replace your BMS with a working one and it's serialized, it simply won't work. I don't really know if Air Twenty Three is the incompatible hardware, um, but, but there are so many damn error codes. My motor controller has one connection to my battery, an XT ninety, like XT sixty, right. to XT ninety. That's it. Yeah. Like no data, no nothing. No, XT. I don't want my controller to know what battery I'm using. My controller, like, don't it, it knows because I tell it. Yeah, this is my my uh, bench test battery. In fact, it says not for install on a PV. This is just. What I used to test ESCs. This is all I want between my motor controller and my battery is an XT90 yeah. or an XT60. That's yeah. and, it. I don't want them talking to each other because no. once they talk to each other, there's the potential for it to say, I don't like you. You're not right. the original one. Mm. Ah, my set's falling apart. Um, so I, I, I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, the thing, okay, so yeah, if you change your grip tape, you void your warranty. The ghosting thing is so strange with the GT. Because when the Pint X came out, this thing, and I did a review on it, and in the beginning of it, I made fun of something about it. This sensor is very hard to activate. In fact, most, like I'd say about half the time I get on it, it won't register both zones, and instead of turning on when it gets sideways, it just flops over. You know, it's called the mount of shame. It's like, I'm so cool. Oh, no, I'm not. It just dumps you off because it doesn't turn on. And they added an extra plastic layer over the pressure resistor, and it makes it harder to engage. So you really got to try. Or oh, sweet what some people did is... Did you see the... I did, but on? I didn't get what was funny about it, Copaz. I looked at it at 2 in the morning, so you got to point out to me what I missed. Um, so this is hard to engage. And, this, and the Pint X rarely ever ghosts. I've actually not seen an example of one of these ghost riding off. Because yeah, the people that were commenting said, like, technically ghosting is a problem with every one of these. It's just the extent to which it ghosts in the GT is so much greater than all the other ones. That's when it's a problem. It's not like if it ghosts, it just right. has to be recalled. But the new one goes so much more than the old one that that's right. the issue. So Future Motion has said that the ghosting issue is related to the foot pad sensor, which I believe... Because that's really what happens. The sensor sticks. It sticks shut. Um, and so on the GT, this sensor is much more sensitive. So where the hell? I don't. They always change the location of the power button. Uh, by the way, did you see that green flash? Yeah. That's the boot up sequence, or what it appears to be. So when they're DOA, you see a green flash, and it doesn't get to this. So when you touch it, see how like it makes it brighter? That's like it's sensing that you've yeah. touched it. Then it fades. And then you touch it again. And so the GT sensor is really sensitive, which in effect is good because it won't ever not register that you're on it. And it's also why, like, some people post it like, oh, my kid can ride it even though they weigh 50 pounds because it'll sense them. Like, my daughter rides the regular pint and she loves it. And she can ride this because she's tiny and it registers her. She can't get on the Pine X because it won't know that she's on there. I can barely register on there and I'm fat. Um, <laughs> But if for some reason, they made the GT foot pad more sensitive, which I get in theory. But the sensors, whether it's temperature or use, and then the plastic over the sensor gets like more pliable, and so it's more likely to stick, um, that seems to be the primary cause of it. I have seen an instance where you over-torque the motor, and even if the sensor is disengaged and it shows it's disengaged, it'll stop, and then it'll just start going in reverse for no reason which I assume is also now a firmware issue. It's like a use case that the motor controller perceives that it wasn't prepared for, and so it reacts in a very strange way. I've seen one instance of that. And so when it comes to ghosting, I think, I think, because I don't know because they're not going to tell anyone. I think it's mostly foot sensor related, but there might be something else. I mean, this thing's been out like three weeks that people have been getting it. I don't know. I don't know, but I don't trust the GT like I trust my XR or even the Pints. I just don't. You know, when I take the GT out, having a great time because it works, and when I and when I know I have to like get off and either rest, I will now go somewhere away from as many people as I can and not near the highway, and then I will heel lift and make sure it turns the hell off. 
On the block diagram, current from the power supply goes to a buck converter, then to a microcontroller, be able to drive the motor. In reality, you have a battery current going to parallel to buck converter. Ah. You expected me to see that at 2 in the morning? A, that's, that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot between a battery and an ESC. Um, Nail. Nail. Damn. <sighs> we went over the serialized BMS. Yeah, we did the warranty. Which is totally, you... total Apple bullshit, by the way. We you, did the, you, you, you change your tire. Um, oh, so on the GT, so this, every one wheel up until the GT has had a standardized rim size based on a go-kart tire. And there are go-kart tires of all different sizes, but it was a six-inch rim. And so that's why on the V1, even though the rim shape was different to the Plus, to the XR, even to the Pint, these are all go-kart tires. Standard. Hoosier, Burris, Vega. Unili is the company that they use now. They're like a Taiwanese larger manufacturer of budget tires. Uh -huh. um, I mean, this tire wasn't cheap. It was like $80, but you're only buying one. But it's a really good tire. It's soft. The shape is nice. And it does change because it's the only point of contact between you and the ground. It changes how the board rides. So most people who want something different out of their board will just change the tire. Magic. I love this thing now. Right? Um, on the GT, so this is a... Five, is this a six inch rim? Five and a half inch rim? I don't know. The tire size is on the tire. Uh, six inch rim. There you go. So it's actually the same size bead as the XR. Standard. Want to find a go kart tire, generic or branded? Oh, doesn't so matter. Messy. The GT has a rim size that's a half an inch bigger. That's a troll question. Um, that's a really short video. You can modify it by leaving it in the box and attempting to ride it that way. <laughs> I actually have a shirt. I'm, I'm wearing this shirt for a specific reason. I don't know if you know Boosted. Yeah. But I, I using um, a cricket that I got my, for my wife for her 40th birthday, I made a shirt. It's someone falling off their one wheel, and underneath it says user error. Because my joke that I tell people is like, no matter what happens, it's user error. Because if you don't use it, there are no errors. And that's, that's the <laughs> But anyway, the GT has a rim size that is a half an inch bigger. And that's not a thing in go-karts at all. So this tire, no six inch standard go-kart tire will fit on the GT. So is this a case where the only tire that fits on it is one that's made by them? Currently, yes. Now, of course, the aftermarket- They came up with their own standard. They did. What's the benefit? How does this benefit the end user? Is there a particular reason? Is it a traction thing? Is it a better for off-road? Is there anything about that tire being that size that makes it better for the user? No. In fact, I mean, it's, it, it depends on who you are. Um, there are no good reasons in practice for it that I can find. I have to qualify it. That I can find. There are some instances where that particular rim size is a little worse. And it has to do with the sidewall height. And so depending on your inflation pressure, like this has a slightly taller sidewall of tire between ground and rim. And so if you have a low tire pressure and you ride off a curb and the tire squishes on impact, you have a shorter distance to the rim edge there, which could potentially cause more damage as the tire squishes. Um, so that's, the, that's a potentially negative effect. Positive reason for that, I don't know. I do not know. That's just the thing that happened. Now, naturally, because the one wheel world is so devout and large, companies will come out with tires that fit it. It's just a lame standard to Oh, absolutely. Put out it is. It lame is very much a word that works for many of the things that we have come to learn about. So since I have 10 minutes of your time before you have to get on with chores, we uh, can we now. can stretch it a little bit. Let's say 20. It, it, I mean, I don't want to like keep you here and be like you're in my I country. got time. Now. Sweet. Okay, damn. Uh, the GT thing, we kind of talked about most of it. I mean, the, the, the tire on it is, is kind of gross. It's not terrible, but that's the thing, is that they've offered two different tire choices, a slick, which is what I prefer, and a treaded. Treaded's fine. It seems to be much harder, like the rubber, or at least the way it's constructed, like the carcass of it, is much harder. And a lot of the folks that are really into trail riding, which is why you would want a treaded tire, don't love it because you have to run it at damn near empty, mm -hmm. like five PSI. I ride, I ride that at 18 oh, PSI, um, which is low for me. Like on this, this is at like 25 PSI. And that thing's 10 PSI lower because that makes it feel relatively the same. It's a hard kind of weird, gross tire. So in terms of just performance, I don't know why that tire's on it because you there are so many examples of straight up better tires. But it's also a wear part. And the other thing is that the tires are made by Unili. 
and this became a thing when the Pint was released, Unily has a slightly higher defect rate than a higher end company because it's a cheaper tire. Um, I've had three Unily tires come across me that were defective, as in there's a lump, there's a bulge. So whenever you ride at every rotation, you feel like that bump, 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 bump. And it sucks because you only have X amount of miles or time before you can send it back. But if you don't want to void your motor warranty, they have to change it to another Unily tire. Which sucks. Because yeah. people were complaining about Unily tires in the, they're in not, the comments in my head. They're not the worst, but they're not very good. That doesn't sound like an endorsement. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've never put another Unily tire on a one wheel. The, the old stock tire was a Vega. Um, and they're, they're very particular. Most people hate them because they're very flat and hard. Some people love them because they're flat. You know, so there are some trick riders that I know, my buddy Dave, he loves the Vegas. He'll take the ones that people rip off of their one wheel. He's like, just give it to me. I don't care. Huh. Um, Talk about the GT Stator Ridge disallowing the XR hub. Oh, that's a complicated one. <laughs> Have you heard about this? Um, no. All right. So the actual measurements of the hub are not that different. So the GT hub and the XR hub are, as far as can be seen, the same. Wattage rating is the same, you know, and they very much underrate the wattage. Um, there was a DIY one wheel that I ended up giving away using a Future Motion hub, and I pumped like 2,200 watts into that thing before it started to even get warm. The, to, to their credit, those motors are legitimate, but they changed the machining on the GT hub just slightly. Because, um, you know, you have the stator, which is that, you know, with all the coils, and then you've got the rotor, which is what the tire is mounted to, and that's the hub. You can pull the you can pull the rotor off of a XR or a pint and swap them, because they're machined to the exact same axle. So you know you could like I could pull this rotor off of here and I could put it on that and put a certain tire and it'll fit and it'll just work. You can't do that on that, even though the spec of the motor is the same. They machine the axle and the plates that mount as you slide into the axle just barely enough that it won't fit. So what some folks have done is they, they figured I could put an XR rotor onto the stator of the GT, and now I can use whatever tire I want because the rim size is what it used to be. But you can't unless you machine either a shim to get it to fit or you machine the axle to fit. But it's such a small change. I, I don't remember exactly what the dimensions are, but it's just a lip. It's like a, a machined in lip. That's it. There's nothing structural about it because it's maybe like a fraction of a millimeter. Um, but it was clearly evident that it was done just to disallow someone sticking a rotor from an XR onto the GT stator. I know with the Bafang BBS HD, at some point they made some sort of modification to the rotor. Uh, because they noticed a lot of them were breaking and then mm -hmm. the newer design didn't and it was slightly different. Is there any possibility that perhaps the reason that they did that was because this, uh, maybe they were noticing a lot of breakages or, like I know with the BBS HD in 2018 and 19, you had a lot of people that would just have the, the rotor, the little piece, I forget what you call this thing, uh, the, the thing that fits inside the nylon gear would just break off. From, mm. and, it, and it was really like the, it's like a motor pinion or something yeah yeah the pinion and it's really annoying that it would break off and they modified it slightly and California e-bike who's really cool, really cool guy who runs them has a blog post on the differences uh, between the two different motors and then and the new one that I like I haven't broken that pinion in the newer one in like three years I put right more watts than I care to admit in a live stream into that thing but I have not killed it like with 3600 watts RMS just vroom and I is I, there no <laughs> I mean okay not no I haven't seen the, the the two most common points of failure on a one wheel motor are there are two spots where they fail the most one is the edge of the rim and usually it's from impact off-road trail a rock can chip it Sometimes these things just entirely chunk off. And so the actual edge of the rim is a common failure point, semi-common. And then right where the bearing is, mm -hmm. there are two bearings on either side of the axle. If your bearings, if you never change them or service them or whatever, they'll eventually wear out and seize. And then it'll spin around the axle and wear out the axle. Neither of those seem like they would warrant the specific kind of change because this is an aluminum axle that acts as a heat sink mm -hmm. and it is thick as you can see like that's the actual axle it is not tiny 
Yeah. And it's bolted into a carrier that gets bolted into the rail, which is the frame. That's bigger than the axle on my bike. Yeah. And it's fine because people jump off of things on this and they ride off of rocky trails and all that good stuff. And it is a very tank-like robust design, specifically the change that I've seen on the GT Hub. And again, this is not my area of expertise. I'm not a motor technician. I'm kind of just like a battery guy. I'm not either, but it's never stopped me before. That is totally fair. Um, I don't think so. It, it, it seems kind of cruddy of a thing to do. But also, the GT, and this is, I guess, another nail, the GT has a proprietary charge port. And there's also, there's a PCB in it. So let me grab behind you. Um, the charge port, that I, I forget which one I saw it on. It was the most <sighs> finicky looking thing I've ever... This. The original charge port on the original three one wheels, the V1, the Plus, and the XR, used an XLR plug, which you're no doubtedly familiar with. Yeah. Uh, then the Pint, both the regular and the X, use a GX12 which you can buy anywhere. Um, the GX12 two pin, fine, it's just a plug, right? This, I don't know what the hell this is. It's a proprietary plug, I don't know. This, this, this is, this is, the, this is the, yeah. the GT charger. Yeah, the plug itself is small, but this oh, thing so is bad. chunky. Let me, let me. I tried to get some damaged XR hubs repaired by a local OEM wheel repair shop where my friend was manager. The result was the metal was junk and couldn't be repaired like aluminum alloy wheels as they repair all day long. Oh. Hashtag garbage. There is one guy in Jersey who does like custom fabrication. He makes like one wheel fenders. He's the only one I've ever seen to fix an, uh, a one wheel hub. Like he, he, I don't know, he welds them properly and then sands them and smooths them and seals them. He's the only one I've ever seen actually fix a legitimately cracked motor. Only one. Um, I don't know what he does. Some black magic stuff. But on the GT charge port, I don't know what that plug is. And it could just be my ignorance. Like, this could literally be a plug I haven't seen before. I but haven't this, seen everything. What's the point of using... I, I honestly never understood the use of an XLR plug. I always thought it was because this is a... If this is... For, they, they Somebody just searched for 48 volts, and they saw that this thing that was used for microphone phantom mm -hmm. power... Was right. Like 48 volts at 0 0.000000 amps. And then they thought, let's use it for three or four. Yeah. But like, but like, what's the point of using this over an XT60, an XT90, uh, I don't an XT know. whatever? I, uh, I don't understand this. This well, is just so not... Well, here's the thing, because because when you start looking at numbers, things start to look a bit sketchy. One wheel fast chargers charge at about six amps. You can really charge a one wheel XR probably up to like eight. Some guys charge at like ten, and the connector inside will kind of handle it. But most people charge fast charge of one wheel XR at six amps. This is not the fast charger. The fast charger is behind you if you want to see how big it is. Let me see the fast one, because if that's only at one amp, then the connector is not really going to matter as much. Now, when it comes to chargers, there's like not just the amperage, but there's also the voltage. I like that this has an IEC cord instead of the other junk. I, I know, because the other ones break. But, but, the, so, but this is a fast charger, and this charges at 5.2 amps. It's still the kind of a sissy-ish connector, but this, it, it should work, I guess. In the head of this plug is a PCB. No one's entirely sure what it does. Why is there a PCB in the plug? I don't know. So this is something I saw in one of the GT groups, and a couple of the guys from Stoke Life, Ser Stoke Life Service cut this open and looked at it and looked at the parts on it. Have you discussed about the fact that F Future Motion wires its XT60 in reverse? Yes. yes that was at the very beginning. That we were talking so about the fun. two ways that your average technician figures out that that's the case. That was a moment for me because that was me telling Lewis Rossman, hey, by the way, look at this, which everyone who works on one wheels and their batteries has that moment. I'm genuinely, on, uh, genuinely honored to have been here for your moment <laughs> where it's like, hey, by the way, it's backwards. And you go, what? Why? Exactly. Why? So that was, that was a moment for us. And I'm so proud to have been part of that. But this, so in here, in, Australia or something. in here is a VCB. Two of these pins are positive. One is negative. There is a voltage difference of like one point something volts between both positives to the negative. But the relationship at each voltage like level as the battery charges is not linear. Like it changes, like the actual difference changes as the voltage goes up from the battery. I don't know if there's some sort of handshake between this plug and the BMS. I don't know if it's there as some kind of like soft start. So you avoid arcing when you plug it in. I don't know. Avoiding arcing when plugging in was, is the thing that I would, I would, I would actually try to assume the best in that one particular scenario because well, that is annoying. I always have to remember, <laughs> plug it in and then plug it into the wall afterwards so that my connector doesn't look like crap selfless promotion i made a whole video on, on one wheel charging it's like half an hour long because they say that xt90 has no spark it's like bs no well, everything is everything sparks at, you at have 72 an, volts you haven't yeah volts. you have enough i have like and that's what i usually use for like the big batteries oh, the xt so 
the XD90 Antispark. Spark. It's it looks got like an old resistor. Dell laptop connector. Kind of. Oh my god! Imagine if like the secret to our aftermarket chargers lied in like a Dell a Dell computer charger from ten years ago. Um, okay, so the one wheel XR sparks when you plug it in. The one wheel pint does not. And one thing that I have noticed is that the charge port for the XR and the previous models mm -hmm. go through the motor controller. Then they go into the BMS through the power harness. On the pint, they changed it. The charge plug goes directly to the BMS. My, oh, my assumption was that the sparking was due to the very high level of capacitance that you would have going from the charge port right into the controller uh, because you don't have the same kind of capacitance that you do just going right into the BMS because they're not like very large capacitors. And so you don't get arcing, even though like that, that spark, you don't get it on the pint, even though the pint and the pint X is just a two prong plug, no spark. You plug it in, even if the charger is fully on, no spark. So assuming they designed it similarly, there's no, I don't think the arcing thing is a real reason for this, but I don't know. So this looks like very much an effort to have like only OEM chargers, which is also not ideal because you can argue battery safety till you're blue in the face because most, most end users are not going to dig in and build their own battery. Fine. You know, is it right? I don't think so. I'm sure you don't think so. But the whole charge port thing, like only use proprietary OEM chargers, that's a harder sell. Because everyone has a phone with like five different chargers from wherever the hell they come from. And so it, it just doesn't, this really was, you know, when I talk about like how painful it was, this was the most painful thing. Because like the battery thing, you have that so that sort of uh, conflicting ideas that live in your brain about something that you really, really love. That was painful. The can't ever touch the battery. This was worse. Really? When it, yeah, when it was like, oh, look, there's a PCB in the charger, so you can only even use these chargers. Because I charge everything I own with a power supply. Has anybody confirmed whether that is actually doing talking to it? Not yet. Not yet. Um, it's, it's very much a slow process. He said of, if there's a positive and two negatives, then... Uh, two positives, one negative. Two positives, one negatives, and only three, then where would the communication take place with the device? It could be it's reading the relationship of both positives to the negative. Um, oh, that's lame. Yeah, I mean... I don't know. <laughs> it could be. You know, it could you, be. I, don't I don't know. know. That, that, that's what sucks is that there is just so much I don't know. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that Future Motion tell everybody their secrets. Because why would they? And that, I'm, I mean, it depends on who you are. I'm not sure that that's an entirely... Does anybody sell that, a custom frame to these if somebody wanted to build one? Yes. Let's so let's yes. say if, you know, I want to build something like a one wheel off of an e-scooter motor that I have. Do people sell custom frames? Okay. That is a very complicated question. There is a growing DIY community. Um, let me see. There it is. Okay. I'll get it. And we've got about five minutes left of Mario's time before we are going to have to get going. He does yeah. have a life. <laughs> this is an old one-wheel plus motor on an XR frame, and there's nothing else in it. By the way, that's also, you can tell, it's nothing special. It's just the brushless. I that. I've seen this on a Subvaton before. Yeah, but it's still just a three-phase brushless DLC motor. So this is getting an entire rebuild. And there are guys all around the world who make stuff for aftermarket rebuilds. This is an open-source VESC-based motor controller made by a gentleman, well, designed by a gentleman called Shaman. He's on, like, the DOI forums. Oh, sweet, nice. and that's a good one. That's your way why would a company keep your third-party accessories and make you buy factory parts before shipping your board back for service? From service? Oh, God, Vic is salty, generally. No, he is, but I, I know, would be salty, I, too. That's, no, that's, you're that's, right. That's a proper salt. He's, he's dealt with more of the nitty-gritty nails than I have. He's, he, he's oh, man, I, I, I don't envy the he's things he's had to He's salty as an repair. ocean for all the right reasons. Like, <laughs> no, he's that, right. That's bullshit. Um, but just to kind of answer that whole, can I build on my own one wheel, sort of. The motor thing is rough. If you can source an actual future motion motor and you can actually buy aftermarket rails, like the Float Life makes rails that are shaped just like this out of better aluminum. Like this is Series 6 and the threads in it strip out. They make rails out of Series 7 aluminum and it doesn't strip out. But you can take this motor controller, build your own battery, and you can configure it with a balance application and it will work as a one wheel. It won't work as well because no one yet has really been able to reproduce the kind of PID loops that they use 
and that's really complicated. Like people have been trying for a while. Yeah, I, when I got my, my, I had to turn it down from what they give you at Grin from the, mm-hmm. with the phase one or from stock because I would just turn the throttle and my front wheel would be up in the air. Oh, that's like, fun. I don't instant wheel. No, I saw like in, integral gain was at like two ninety or three fifty, and I'm like, what? <laughs> I dialed it back down to five or ten, and it's like, ah. But then I up proportion. But it's fun to be able to mess with that. Oh sure, yeah. Um, it's gotten better. You know, there's a gentleman named Dotto in California yeah. who has kind of like done like a soft fork of this particular firmware specifically for one wheel shaped things. And it's the best so far. Um, but it's not, the thing is, it's that since it's all open source and everyone's doing it on donated time, there is only so much that can be done because to their credit, Future Motion has been working on their firmware and their behavior for years in years. So this is one thing I wanted to push back. Sure. Somebody said, simple as this. Don't buy into the companies with this type of business model. The public only has themselves to blame because of the I got to have this attitude. And one thing that I found, one thing somebody wanted me to bring up here, yeah. this is in, really, on the technical side, is that a lot of people did not know that they had BMS serialization. They didn't know about the bat, not being able to unplug their battery because they pre-ordered it. Right. So they pre-ordered it, and then once it came out and was ready to ship, it's, oh, by the way, if you unplug your battery, we're going to brick it, and they had already paid for it. And if they wanted to say, hey, listen, I don't want this product anymore because you never told me that it was unserviceable, we're going to charge you a 15% restocking fee. I believe it was 15%. Double check on that. It was a 15% restocking fee if you no longer want to be shipped this thing. that A lot of people don't know about this. And well, the reason sure. that I'm, I'm doing these videos is because I want more people to understand this because most people don't know about this until they open it because it's, n- it's not advertised on their website. I, I imagine it doesn't say on their site, by the way, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, go is 20 miles an hour, really fun a ride. You cannot service your battery and what you own. Like, it, it's, it's just not there. And right. the awareness needs to be uh, put out there. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Right. And, and this is another thing that's that, that bittersweet kind of thing. Um, like, my whole channel for the last two-ish, three-ish years has been entirely about the one wheel. And so, you know, someone to say to me, well, if you don't agree with it and you don't like it, don't buy it. Now, I can't speak for anyone else but myself, but that's not an option for me. Like, currently, like, more than half my content is about the one wheel, and I like doing it because there's an aspect of informing the riders about it. There's an aspect of exploring it, and so it gives people who haven't bought one yet more of an idea of what to expect. You know, and there are a few of... There are a few of us, I hate to say us, there are a few people who make YouTube content specifically for that reason. I buy it so you don't have to. And there are people who review Apple products and products from like MSI, like Gamers Nexus has to deal with Newegg and all of that stuff oh, yeah. because that's part of what they do. And, you know, not to overinflate myself, like this is my job between the repair shop and my channel. This is my job now. And so me buying a GT is a business expense because the videos that come out of it funnel into everything that I do. And it's also part of what I want to do. I like testing stuff. Um, I mean, I made and blew up a battery in Jersey. And that took weeks to design like that actual test, just to test a safety bag, you know, and and so it's, it's part of that. It's part of the whole thing. But yeah, everyone who's been a one wheel fan, whose lives have been changed by the one wheel pint or the XR, of course, when they announce this is the new one, and uh, of course, like I ordered mine in the first five minutes. We all, you know, we're chatting online. Launch event happens. We're all hyped because we're riding boards. We're all in that little culture. And yeah, we all, first five minutes, we all ordered it. And so the stuff that happens naturally is all stuff that any early adopter will run into because they're not going to, why would they advertise, by the way, this will brick if you unplug the battery. By the way, it's a proprietary charger. Eh, like, no, you don't know that until people have gotten it. They've started exploring it. Like one person who I met over the weekend at Eastgate Con is the guy who first found that if you unplug the battery, it bricks. It was that guy. I talked to him in Vegas and he's like, yeah, so that board's gone. And so it's been, it's, it's just there. It doesn't work. Like that's it. It's bricked full stop. And he was the guy that first learned it, but he had to buy it and he had to figure it out. And so now everyone knows that because one person did it. And And there are people that have said that perhaps a balance, even before you get right to repair, would be at the very least if you make a product in this that is this unrepairable, that you have to disclose it to the customer. 
in your advertising materials. Like, hey, by the way, you can't replace the battery on this, and if you try, it'll break. By the way, you can't, you know, the, the controller is serialized to the BMS. Here are all the list of things that you cannot replace because it will brick your device. That would be nice. That seems like a fair compromise because most they don't advertise this. So there's no way for you to know. Mm -hmm. Many people, there's no way to know until it's too late. Yeah. I mean, I won't hold my breath. You know, the, the real fervent, devout enthusiast community of One Wheels or One Wheel Riders is generally a minority you know it's it's very much like I, I i really think the bread and butter of their customer base are casual folks who see like the youtube ads the big influencers who love their one wheel and stuff and they go i want that and then they get it and that's it and then that relationship with the product is all they have the real enthusiast community is not small it is big but in terms of their overall customer base it's it's still a relative minority and so things like that, that would really be ideal for just general consumer rights or the benefit or the peace of mind, and I hate that phrase, um, of the enthusiast and repair community would be wonderful. I'm not holding my breath. Um, it's because I'm a realist, and it's why my whole life is no longer revolved around the one wheel. I ride electric skateboards almost as much now, and I like working on them because you know there are companies that provide DIY parts. There are companies that sell straight up production boards and it breaks and you reach out and even if it's out of warranty, they'll just sell, they'll, they'll sell you the part. My ESC broke. All right, do you know how to put it in? Yes, here you go, it's 85 bucks. Thank you, move on. Um, there's a board right behind the camera that I'm fixing, a custom that I built for someone. Oh, sweet, nice. The remote, the handheld remote, because these skates use like a handheld remote, is made by Hoyt Street out in Portland. And they sell those remotes to like everyone who does DIY. And even like the high-end skateboards start using this remote because it's awesome. And they will sell you every single goddamn part. They will sell you the guts of it. They'll sell you the shell. They'll sell you just the receiver. I sent back a remote. Two days later, I just got a shipping label. Yeah, we fixed it. Here you go. Um, they'll tell you how to fix it. Like a, an issue came up with like the soldering on a couple of the legs for the throttle and people were having issues. They published a guide on how to fix it if you wanted to do it, just to reflow the solder on the legs and secure it with epoxy. So that way when you're like throttling it full, it won't break and kill you. They said, oh yeah, some of these have this issue. Uh, if you can fix it, here's the thing how to fix it. If not, just send it back and we'll just do it and we'll get it back in a couple of days. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing where it's like they, they know what people are doing because Hoyt Street sells full boards, but they know people are using their remotes in their DIYs, and so they'll sell you the remote, they'll sell you every goddamn part on it, and they'll fix it if it breaks, and if you don't want to send it to them to fix, they'll tell you how to fix it, and that's it. And sure, it's a remote, um, but they also, I think they open source the files for like the shell, and so people are making like different shapes of that remote because they don't like the round shape. It's like, it doesn't fit my hand. Cool, here's how the PCB fits. Make a new shell. And like three different people have made different uh, uh, shells for it because it fits your hand. You know, so it's stuff like that. Um, there's a board by Lacroix, a Canadian company. Very expensive. Hit by a car. Very common accident in uh, New York City. By the way, the battery in that one, 2.2 kilowatts. Kilowatt hours. It was fine, but... New deck, new enclosure. I gutted it, put it in the new one, attached the drivetrain. Guys riding it now having it's the time. It's a pleasure to not have to worry about all these little things that you have. I have to attach a chip in order for this battery to work. I right. To and I had to unplug that battery from the BMS, and it was a big old battery. And I had to unsheath it and then rewrap it. And it was this whole thing. And it, it took me a couple of days, but it wasn't a very involved, expensive fix that required neurological surgery. Yeah, and you can um, do it. And it's just, yeah. there's something different when you're working on a device where you don't have to think about all that type of hostile design. Yeah. And, and it makes it fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. And there's a scooter I got to fix. You know, And so the thing is that outside of this particular form factor, there is a world of PEVs, whether it's scooters, bikes, electric skateboards. Electric unicycles are their own world, and we don't have time to get into that because that's that's a thing. But um, speaking of, you have to you have to get going. We are six minutes after, right? Yeah, I got really got ahead. Like I literally have to leave in like fifteen minutes. Like I got to be out the door in fifteen. But but okay, just so we'll have five minutes. More. Yeah. So so so. But but just to close, you know, you know, when people are like, "We'll ride something else," I do, I do. There's a whole world, and I'm not saying don't buy a one wheel because the one wheel in many cases, like, saved my life. Like, if it weren't for the, the mental health improvements that I got from riding it, I probably wouldn't be standing here, which it's is a little bit... Than riding yeah. the train. The exactly. thing that I got out of... In 2018, when I swore off taking the subway, 
I was so much happier. And it's not even like it's not because uh like you know there were criminals in the subway that were mad at me or anything like that. It wasn't it was just you're in an underground dungeon. And right. if I'm it, especially when I started doing this as a business, I was doing house calls. I spent 3 or 5 hours a day on the subway going back and forth to all different yeah. parts of New York City. And when you just see the crumbling garbage junk it's just it's a 100 year old fucking tunnel below the ground that hasn't been maintained in 100 years it's a hell it town look, for bastard people no, it, just, it, it, it looks it's disgusting and when you actually yeah. get to ride around and see grass and be able to see the water and be breathe able to go air over the bridge and like you know and you're controlling it yourself it's so much more fun and it really is good for your mental health yeah and and and, and, and that has been the effect for so many people where it's like this device has saved my life this device has actually brought me some contentment, you know? And so ride something else, A, yes, I do. But B, you can't just tell a whole bunch of people. I mean, you, you can literally tell them, well, sell it and do something else. But, it, it, but, it's, but you're ignoring what I think, and I, I remember you hearing say this, like the, the humanity of it. You know, it's not just numbers and product numbers and serial numbers and all that stuff. There's, there's people that ride this, that it means something to them. The other thing is the, is the amount, the degree to which they've abused patent law to make sure that other people can't make something very similar to this. Even <sighs> We don't have time for that now. That'll be episode two. Episode yeah. two. But, uh, but they, there's a lot of patent law abuse, in my opinion, that goes on here to make it so that other companies cannot easily compete. It seems to be that way. However, since that is so far and away from my expertise it's yeah. just like a battery guy. That's like a conversation I, I, I have with Leonard French and Steve Lato. Right. I, I want to have that conversation with them at, the, at some point. I very much like to stay in my lane and I, <laughs> I hope that I've done that. Um, I'm going to go over a couple of the... Sure. I was reading these out of my peripheral vision just to ask you interesting questions. I'm going to go over this quickly so that you can get out the door. And uh, let's see. Is this Mario Contino? Yes, it is. I have a link to his website in the description. I'll put a link to his channel as soon as I'm done with this. I was rushing to uh, put that in there. The port is probably a TA3F3 pin. Cool. Pre-ordering anything is a bad idea. If a company doesn't have the overhead to produce a well-working product or service, don't buy from them. I've avoided pre-orders because I believe everything is vaporware until I see otherwise. Says that's a complicated one and proceeds to articulate clearly what the problem is. Yes. Hmm. Any interesting questions left here? Mm. I mean, we, we really kind of covered a lot. Mm. All right. right. Yeah, so that that's about that. I will, yeah, just check out his channel. Is it, your channel is just your name, right? Yeah, Mario Contino. It's Mario Contino on YouTube. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank this is a you. bunch of fun. Yeah, I, it was an absolute pleasure and an honor, honestly. It's, it's beautiful you. to see that there are companies out there that actually try to make the lives of independent technicians <laughs> even harder than the people who work on Apple products. Uh, I didn't think that was possible. Wow. Uh, mm, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, you have a good day. You as well. Thank oh, you so okay. much, and thank you all, honestly.